Welcome to Vasm Assembly episode 8. I'm in a studio in New York, and last week I was in Sunnyvale when we recorded it, the session with Thomas Nadestad. Today, as I said, I'm in New York, and with me today is Steve Manuel from a company called Dilepso. Welcome, Steve. Hey there, Thomas. Thanks for having me today. How are you doing? Doing great. I heard you had problem with, problems with uh, your office. So you went to the office to record in the <laughs> office, and then you had to return home to record from home because the office wasn't uh, open yet. That is right. Yeah, thank you, WeWork. I uh, had to turn around and drive back through some Bay Area traffic to get home to record. So <laughs> I appreciate some flexibility. <laughs> the things we like. OK, yeah. awesome. Uh, and you work for a company called Dilipso. And um, on the website, it says the company's mission is a group of software builders on a mission to take all software squishy. That's a nice mission statement. <laughs> Can you summarize what <laughs> Dilipso actually does and why you bet on WebAssembly? And that's, of course, why you are here on this podcast. Absolutely. Yeah, we're, we're first and foremost huge fans um, and evangelists of WebAssembly. Uh, but the company's main focus is to help all other companies make their software more extensible. We like to say make squishy software. And WebAssembly is a great yes. choice for this, mostly for its isolation and security characteristics, uh, but also for its portability. So you can now take a set of your customer's code and run it inside your application, giving them this you know, if infinitely extensible environment for them to make your software do, make your software do more things than it was originally designed to do. Amazing. And so you have a couple of products there. Um, I guess most people know you for a software product that is open source called Xtism. But let me just briefly run down and then let me actually uh, make you run down the products that you have. So there is uh, Xtism, sure. there is uh, XTP, there is Observe. There's something called Chicory. Um, can I just very briefly introduce uh, us to all of these products that you're building? And then we will talk more in detail about Xtism, which is, as I said, the product that most people know you for. Yeah. Um... Yeah, you mentioned Xtism is an open source project, is really a framework to make working with WebAssembly easier. We'll go more in depth in a minute, I'm sure, so I'll skip forward. XTP is kind of like the day two operational platform to make running WebAssembly plugins inside your application easy. Um, and this is actually only about a month old. We just launched XTP in late September. Um, and it basically gives you a super easy platform to make your SaaS application extensible by your customers and let them push plugins directly into that code uh, and then safely call that code directly in process, which is kind of the really magical unlock that WebAssembly is providing. And it actually is uh, kind of the source of inspiration for the company's name, Dilibso, uh, which is a contraction of the Dilib, the dynamic library format on Mac, and the SO shared object format on Linux, which were really the you know, only ways to run uh, dynamically loaded code in an application, but suffering so kind of severe security risks. Most people didn't do it. And so WebAssembly is now presenting this opportunity to do so. And XDP makes for a platform to provide software um, with an easy way to let users ship extensions in any language they choose, independent of the language that the core software is written in. Gotcha. Um, and I'm so sorry to interrupt here. Um, I tried looking real hard, but I couldn't find what does XTP actually stand for? <laughs> it doesn't really stand for anything. It's a name oh, that okay. kind of sounds cool, kind of could be extension platform, could be ex Xtism platform. Uh, underneath XTP's kind of convenience layers, it's all built on top of Xtism. Um, so, yeah, it's not really an acronym for anything. Okay, understood. All right, so next is, uh, uh, I think, next on the list. Yeah. Yeah, we, we had to kind of build a grounds up um, stack for observability inside of your WebAssembly code. Um, because of the way that WebAssembly is designed and works, you can't really use traditional instrumentation and telemetry tooling like a Datadog agent has no access into the WebAssembly code as it runs within a runtime because of the isolation. And so we had to create ways of instrumenting WebAssembly code that worked across the vast uh, ecosystem of WebAssembly runtimes and languages. And so it's effectively a set of imports in a module uh, that your code can call. And when you compile your code to WebAssembly, it is that set of imports that then emit telemetry out in a variety of formats. Uh, most most useful is the uh, open telemetry format. Um, and we also have a compiler that takes uninstrumented WebAssembly code in uh, and returns instrumented profiled code in, in out of that compiler so that if you don't control the WASM code or if you want to instrument dependencies that you can't 
change the source code of, uh, but otherwise load as libraries into your software. Uh, you can use the observe compiler uh, to mutate WASM code and transform it to have full instrumentation. Interesting. So um, you said open telemetry is um, a format you export to, and like uh, judging from the name, it sounds like this is something that um, other um, like telemetry software can deal with. Um, that is proprietary and I guess open source. Is that is that right? Yeah. Awesome. Correct. Yeah, open telemetry is a standard that's well supported, uh, kind of in mostly the cloud native space uh, to take aggregate statistics logs, metrics, and traces from applications and visualize it over time so that operators can understand what's going on inside their software. So before the Observe SDK, you may see a distributed trace inside of your application that starts with a web request into an app, it does some work, and then it gets to WebAssembly, and it's just one long line of running some WASM code. And that's kind of unfortunate because there's a lot going on inside that one long line, but you didn't have access to it. And Observe makes it easy to kind of see what's actually going on in those WASM function calls, uh, even though the runtime and the normal tracing solutions don't have access to actually see what's inside that WASM code. All right, understood. Cool, and then we have uh, finally Chicory. Yeah, Chicory is um, a pure Java uh, WebAssembly runtime to execute WASM code inside of Java applications. Um, supports the full JVM ecosystem and targets down to JDK 11. Um, so lots and lots of Java applications can now run WebAssembly code, uh, just like you know your Go applications can use Wazero and your Rust applications can use Wasm Time and things like that. There, uh, outside of the Growl Wasm project by Oracle, was really no way to natively run WebAssembly code inside of Java without linking to the CFFI to get something like WASM time, et cetera, loaded into Java applications. And for lots of good reasons, most Java developers don't want to link uh, foreign code into the JVM. So having a pure Java runtime um, kind of finally allows WebAssembly to make its way into the Java ecosystem too. Nice. And um, can you expand CFFI? What is CFFI? The CFFI is a foreign function interface that allows you, in your language, to operate with code written in another language. Um, and this is kind of a more traditional way to link code from other languages uh, into your application. So maybe you use SQLite from your Go application. You, in many cases, would link to the SQLite shared, uh, shared library that is written in C um, and compiled to a dynamic library. And your Go application would, through some magic at the compiler level, link to the symbols inside of that C code and be able to run C functions from Go. Uh, so it's kind of the old way to mix and match language code um, and there's a lot of work in WebAssembly to make that a little nicer. OK, cool. Um, all right, so before we go into maybe Chicory um, closer to the end, I want to talk a lot about XTISM, because as I said, that's the product that most people associate um, your company with. And um, the first thing that people will um, see when they go to their homepage is, I guess, this amazing logo. And um, for the people who haven't seen it, <laughs> let me just try to um, yeah describe what you're seeing. Um, it is a skull, and out of the skull, a skull crawls an octopus, and um, there's like I think on the on the uh, homepage you have an FAQ where people say like there's strong opinions either uh, side. So some people hate it, some people love it. <laughs> I'm more in the I'm just fascinated by it. But can you tell a little bit more? And of course we will, we will link um, the uh, logo in the show notes. But can you just uh, explain uh, how did you come up with this? Uh, what's the story behind it? Absolutely, yeah. Um... Yeah, you know, I think you know every every project needs a, uh, a highlighting logo, and you know the more jarring and memorable they are, I think the better the project is off for it. Um, Xtism, you know, in its own right, is kind of a crazy project uh, if you were to think about it from common wisdom, which is like don't ever runtime evaluate untrusted code, period. And WebAssembly changes that. WebAssembly provides the right security characteristics and runtime concerns to load untrusted code and execute it with a level of uh, guarantee that enables this use case. And so firstly, you know, it's a bit of a crazy idea. And so I wanted to reflect that in the project name and logo. Um, and this idea of loading plugin code from inside of my application and running it in process um, is reflected by kind of the 
the tagline to extend from within and say, I want to actually run code in, inside my process, load it locally, and execute that code in my application. I don't need to call out to a serverless application or to a sidecar or to another microservice or something. Um, I can actually run that code inside of my application. And so the you know octopus creeping through the skull is a little bit of like the plugin kind of being encapsulated inside of the application. Um, but yeah, it's just supposed to, you know, spark the imagination and be, be memorable. So I think it's working. It is definitely working. Um, do you print t-shirts like heavy metal t-shirts, Xtism t-shirts that look like? We do. Yeah. If you're uh, if you're a contributor or you meet us at a conference, we'll have uh, we'll have swag for you for sure, and I'll I'll send you one, Tom, too. <laughs> awesome. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, like we talked about the logo, but like actually what is Xism? So let me just briefly try to summarize and then I uh, have Steve, of course, chime in and uh, yeah, complete my explanation. So Xism essentially can be used in two directions. So let's start with the um, first direction, which is probably the uh, one that most people use. Um, it's something where you can run plugins. And we will talk about what is a plugin even uh, in a couple of minutes. Um, but the idea is um, you have a VASM module and um, with Xism in this one direction, you can um, run this VASM module from your other language. So let's say you have uh, code in PHP and from this PHP code, you wanna call into a WebAssembly module. And um, yeah, this is where Xism comes in. You can just uh, include the Xism libraries in your PHP code, um, point at your VASM module, and then just transparently run it. It will just come back as a result. You can uh, work with this result as if it were a regular PHP function that you called into. But actually what you did in the background is you called into um, a VASM module. And um, yeah, there's a number of uh, concepts involved. And um, the first one that people should probably learn about is the plugin concept. Um, Steve, can you just uh, explain a little bit more? What is a plugin? Yeah, a plugin is kind of like a unknown runtime dependency that your core application can defer a decision made by the application to that external code. So a lot of times this is a core application um, and a plugin comes from a customer or a third-party developer who wants to support a new feature, new functionality inside that core application, that the core team who creates that application either didn't think of themselves just because you know nobody has all the answers and all the ideas, uh, or they don't have the time or would prefer not to make it a first-party kind of first-class citizen inside the application. Maybe it's just uniquely useful to that one, one particular customer. Um, and the plugin code gets to execute at some point in the application's lifecycle. Usually it's like before or after some kind of database mutation. Lots of times these plugins are in the form of a, a hook into data lifecycle points inside the app. Uh, but the point is that the code comes from somewhere outside the application and then gets run inside the application. Um, and typically you're making a choice between uh, performance and security with a plugin system. I'm going to run in, you know, kind of a interpreted language inside of my app, like JavaScript or Lua, which ultimately is, is fairly slow, but it's more secure. Uh, that code doesn't have access to things inside your application like native code would. Um, or you take the more performant route and do something like a dynamic library or shared object, depending on the platform you run. Um, and the risk there is that that code has access to the same memory space and address space of the program that can call your functions, it can read your memory, it can mutate that memory, it can change a function at runtime, and your code is now calling something that it didn't expect to call. Uh, so the risks are very high. And WebAssembly provides this kind of beautiful blend, you know, the best of both worlds that give you near native performance, uh, as well as the security that you need to actually do this, um, you know, at, at a level of uh, guarantee that things aren't going to go wrong inside the application, that you do still have control as the host app and can call plugin code. Um, these are also very popular in like some of the most successful software in the world. And my belief is that this, set, this the software is as, as successful as it is because of these plugin systems. So if you think about WordPress or Shopify, Salesforce, you know, large ERP systems uh, like SAP, um, these are largely successful because they have built an ecosystem around the core software that lets their users extend that software to do new things that is independent of the original author of that code. Understood. So this was the one direction um, that people can use Xism, but then there's the other way around. Um, and this is essentially writing an Xism plugin. So let's say you have um, yeah, someone who is familiar with Go 
and um, they write some library in Go. You can then compile this library to WebAssembly, create a, pl a plugin, and by that, allowing others, for example, um, those uh, from before who wrote this application in PHP, to then use your Go code compiled to WebAssembly as if it were uh, something that was written for PHP. So it's like you start with an entirely different thing, compile it to WebAssembly, and then people using yet another entirely different thing can use it as if it were native. So um, any new concepts that people should be aware of in, in this other direction? I mean, there's there's always a challenge when it comes to you know taking code from one language and running it in another, which is basically the translation of the data, the memory from the PHP code into the language that you're embedding um, in the form of the plugin, in the case you described, Go. And there are, you know, in, in different plugin systems, different concerns and things like that. But for WebAssembly in particular, it is that the memory actually needs to be copied into the WebAssembly runtime. And that is just a guarantee that the WebAssembly spec makes. You're not going to access external memory. It needs to be copied into the runtime, into the WASM's memory space, so that the WASM code can find that memory and use it inside of the application, inside of the WASM code itself. And so to translate from PHP classes and types into Go's structs and types um, usually means there is a serialization step that has to happen as that data gets moved from the Go, from the PHP side into the Go side. Um, and so, you know, some people ask a lot of questions about how's the best way to kind of make this performant and how do we, you know, minimize the you know, impact of the serialization. and I think our most common answer is like, really just don't worry about it. We use whatever kind of serialization works best for you because at the end of the day, the serialization is behind an entire copy. And so it's not going to be a super substantial operation um, when WASM fundamentally has to copy you know, that data into um, the WASM side anyways. Um, so from a conceptual side, I think it's just getting over that hump of like, we have to copy the data anyways. Just go ahead and serialize, serialize it using JSON or Protobuf or whatever really works best for your application. But picking a serialization format um, does sometimes uh, trip people up about, okay, why can't I just send my PHP class as the foo over to the WASM module? Um, but it's pretty quickly mediated when they understand, oh, I just got to turn it to JSON and get going. Hmm. So let's say we have... Um... Yeah, some existing business logic written in Go, like, uh, I don't know, some sort of um, scientific statistics uh, package, for example, written for Go. And I want to bring that um, yeah, in a form that your PHP um, application developers can use it. You would um, yeah, run this through the, um, the plugin code um, with the SDK, um, make it XTSM compatible. But like Assuming there were already this uh, existing Go package that your developers have written, like what does it take to make this then something that people can actually use with XTSM? So there's an SDK that you need to code against, um, but of course, maybe your existing business logic written in Go was not written with this SDK in mind. Um, what, what are the uh, adaptations that developers need to uh, make in order to make this actually work? One of the really, I think, beautiful things about XTSM is that in any way you're using it is just a library. So whether you're calling you know, the WASM code inside of your JavaScript app or your Ruby app or PHP or Go or Rust or Java or whatever, we support like 16 different languages now. Um, it's just a library that you load like any other dependency. Um, and on the plugin side, the same is true. If I want to compile that Go code you know, with that statistical analysis function to WebAssembly, all I need to do is uh, pull down the XTSM Go PDK, which is the plugin development kit. And the Go PDK just has the kind of helper functions that make it easy to move data across that WebAssembly guest host boundary uh, to reference imported functions from the embedding environment. So in this case, the PHP code that's going to run that Go program. Um, and to do other things like call out to an HTTP endpoint, should the host allow it, uh, or to read and write files um, or, or, or get configuration from that host environment. So it's just a library that your Go code would now reference as a dependency. And um, when you do that, there's one step to, to make that Go code pluggable into any other application that runs an XTSM host. And that is just to wrap 
a entry point as a exported WASM function. And so usually in Go, you have a magic comment that you put above your function that you want to export into the WebAssembly environment. Um, and that magic export or function or comment just looks like a couple slashes with the word export in front of it. And a function signature uh, that will be available in that WASM code uh, to call from PHP. And Xism is a little bit unique in its kind of calling convention in that functions don't really take parameters per se. You actually load input from the host environment. And this allowed us to simplify the function signature um, so that all it does is it takes no parameters and it returns a single integer as a kind of status code. And so when you get into the body of that function that would contain the Go code that is to like run the statistical analysis in your example, the first step is to load input from the environment. And that just comes in a form of bytes. And so XDSM functions are purely a bytes in using this input loader and bytes out using an output setter. And um, that dramatically simplifies kind of the plugin oper operation as it pertains to being called from the other side of the equation from the embedded environment in your example PHP. So when you go to the homepage and um, you look at these two directions, um, you're presented with a list of options. So um, you're like, hey, I'm a PHP developer. I want to use WebAssembly. Or, hey, I'm a Go developer. I want to use, um, I want to write uh, a plugin for XTism. Um, so you need a, a PDK. Um, but there's less PDKs um, than there are ways to run um, WebAssembly code from other languages. Um, so let's say I actually come from a PHP world and I want to write with my PHP code something that can be used in XTism. So I'm looking for a PDK plugin development kit for my PHP code, but then, oh, there's nothing on the website because it's just not supported yet. Um, I could go go or I could go whatever. Um, but for PHP in particular, um, just to uh, continue with this example, there's nothing. So. Is this um, just the end of the story, or is there a way for people to, you know, send a PR and add PHP as a as a feature for the PDK, or like, how how would that work? Absolutely, yeah. I mean, the <laughs> it's a symptom of the variety of languages that can compile to WebAssembly uh, being lower than the variety of languages that you can embed WebAssembly in, um, and part of that is just because it's not the easiest thing to build a WebAssembly backend for your language if it compiles to native code. Um, and the other part is that some languages don't compile at all. They're running in interpreters. And so PHP is one of those. Now, PHP does have support to run in WebAssembly, but it's the PHP interpreter that runs in WebAssembly and loads PHP code. Um, so I'll jump ahead and say that it is totally possible, and we would love to see a PR um, to have a PHP PDK enabling you to run plugins in PHP and run them in the variety of XDISM host languages. Um, we just have not had the prioritization to do it yet quite yet. We have done two languages that run in interpreters, which are JavaScript and Python. Um, and there are just a bunch of additional complexities involved with linking imports dynamically to interpreted languages. Um, you know, in, in JavaScript and in Python, there's a, a additional compile step that we have some additional compiler tools uh, that piece together a kind of a new WebAssembly module that links in the interpreter, that links the import functions that the host application has defined. Um, and so it gets a, it gets a little more complicated than your your you know general purely compiled languages are, um, but it's, it's totally possible. And uh, we're, we're very happy to work with you if you are interested in, in creating a new PDK to support the language that you like. Um, but it ultimately just comes down to kind of prioritization. We're, we're, we're a small team and you know, can only do so much. Um, but at some point, we'll do PHP. All right, so if you're a PHP developer and you want to see a PDK, definitely reach out to Steve. And um, yeah, the Dalipsa team might make it happen for you or with you. Um, nice. So. When you look into um, WebAssembly, um, you're like completely new to the world of WebAssembly. Something that relatively quickly reaches you is this uh, pitch of, hey, you write code in one language and then compile it to WebAssembly and um, run it um, yeah, in another context that your code was not initially written for. And um, if you look a little deeper, at some point you will hit the um, WebAssembly component model. You will hit WIT, um, the WASM interface type language, um, which sort of, does like in a standards way what XTism does in a like 
pre-standards client-side mode um, way. Um, would it be fair to say that um, like the VASM component model um, with and so on is standardizing everything that um, XTISM has like freeform trailblazed or is that is that not a fair um, summary? I think there are there's certainly some overlap. Um, uh, the component model had actually been around for quite some time uh, before XTISM existed. And we took a good look at the component model and decided that it really wasn't the approach we thought was the right one, particularly for the plugin use case. Um, and there's a variety of things that XISM does uh, that the component model either doesn't necessarily need to do or care to do, um, because our focus really is around building a sophisticated plugin system uh, that works universally. And one of the kind of key things that XISM has done. And this kind of goes back a little bit to the point around, you know, which PDKs and SDK languages are supported, which is that XISM has taken a universal first approach, not a feature first and then get to universal later, like the component model has. And XISM has decidedly restricted some capabilities um, for feature support where we know we can't get that feature in a, a specific language. And so I like to think about XISM really as like, kind of like jQuery. And the reason we had jQuery back in the day was because it smoothed out all of these inconsistencies across the variety of browsers that JavaScript developers had to program against. So if you wanted to do things with animations or making network calls, you ultimately had to do some switching and detection inside that JavaScript code to figure out which browser am I in? Which features does it have? Does it support fetch? Does it have XML HTTP requests? Does it have this animation API or do I have to do this in CSS? And jQuery saved everybody for, for many, many, many years um, by smoothing out those inconsistencies and saying, you know what, we're just going to give you this one single API and you can call jQuery.post and we'll figure out whether you're in Safari or Internet Explorer or Firefox or wherever, and we'll translate that universal API call that you made to the proper one, depending on where you are. And the story of WebAssembly is very similar, right? We have all these runtimes, all these backends that you can write WebAssembly code for, but depending on what language that WASM code came from, maybe it has some additional runtime functions that need to be instantiated before the code will actually execute properly. Or maybe the embedding language doesn't actually support the same kind of HTTP callout that you expect in your code to have. Um, and so XTISM has you know, intentionally been very, very careful to design a system so that it works the same independently of whatever language either you're calling it from or you're compiling it to WebAssembly from. And so that whole matrix that you see on the site of all the SDK languages and all the PDK languages can interoperate seamlessly because we've been very, very careful to support all of the different combinations of the, of the languages in those feature of the features in those languages um, so that we don't leave anything out or you're not caught by surprise that, oh, I compiled this XDISM plugin for Go and now I need to run it in Ruby, um, but it's not working. Like that should never happen. And so we've made it very, very, we made, we've been very, very sure that every feature we pick and every capability we add to XDISM works universally. We've created XTP to kind of bring some of the things that people want from the component model into the world of WebAssembly uh, without having to use all of the component model. Um, and those are the things like strong typing and bind gen uh, code generations for the plugin to host operability. So I can describe a type in our schema format, which is actually just open API, and that will then generate bindings for um, the WASM code to be able to create a type, fulfill that type, and send it to a host. Uh, or to take that type from a host in an export when that host calls one of the plugin functions. Um, would it make sense to combine WIT with uh, XTISM? So let's make a super simple, very stupid example. So let's say you have uh, an XTISM plugin that is an addition function. So you know it takes two ints as an input and then returns another int or int 32 um, as an output, an input. Um, and then you describe that in wit. Would it make sense to um, yeah ship this wit description with uh, your XTISM plugin, or is this completely not necessary because you have the typings um, that are based on the language already? Yeah, yeah. So because firstly, I, th I think it could it could work. Um, we have thought about it a lot, um, and we're we're open to do it. No one's really asking us for it. 
Um, and one of the concerns we have in doing that is that it, it forces one of the sides, either the host application that's calling the plugin or the plugin developer themselves, to redefine a type that likely already exists into wit. And so if you already have the JSON open API spec, or you have it in YAML, or you already have like the Rust struct or the Go struct or something defined in your, op- your application layer, you have to redefine all that stuff into wit in order for it to work. And we just don't think that's a necessary step. You've got JSON, you've got Protobuf, you've got all the other serialization technologies that are already likely represented by the application in some way or another to have to retype all of the code, all of the types, everything in the world in order to make that interoperability work, we just think is an unnecessary step and could be completely skipped. Um, and so until you know people are demanding this, uh, we're happy the way that things are working and most users are perfectly happy using JSON or Protobuf or something that they're already familiar with to just transmit the type information across the boundary. So a provocative way of interpreting your answer here would be to say, you look at um, the WebAssembly component model as and WIT as something that is mostly like scientific ivory tower, whereas your users just want to get stuff done. And um, it works because, you know, you have these uh, low-key profiles like uh, JSON, like uh, protobufs and so on. Is that a fair interpretation or is that too provocative? I, I would I would be I'm very much in support saying that, yeah, you can, you know, be provoked in that way. Um, <laughs> and, uh, you know, I, I, I think that the component model can work. Um, it just has a long way to go. And people want features now. They want support now. We have the technology now. Um, and I think there's a major risk of it also splitting the ecosystem where the component model requires an incompatible binary format that unfortunately doesn't work in any runtime uh, except the ones that the Bytecode Alliance creates, um, which is exclusive to WASM time today. So if you want to run WASM everywhere, you can't really use the component model. Are you working with the Bytecode Alliance at all on uh, like making what they built a little bit more compatible with what Xtism has built? We have tried in the past. Um, and in fact, we gave the, our Observe SDK um, the initial implementation of the WIT world for observing WASM code to the WASI Observe project. Um, but that started to go in a direction that we you know, didn't really need or care to you know, contribute to. Um, so not, not at the moment. We're not doing a whole lot together. Okay, so let's switch topics a little bit. Um, let's talk about um, using Xtism from JavaScript. Um, like in JavaScript, obviously, you can just um, WebAssembly dot instantiate streaming and then point it at your WebAssembly fetched uh, resource. Um, but like, there's also a way to do it with um, Xtism. Um, so using the plugin system from Xtism, what is the added value of doing that versus just uh, YOLOing it with uh, WebAssembly dot uh, instantiate streaming? Yeah, um, so Xism is basically a thin layer on top of the best runtime for your application. And so in JavaScript, that's going to be whatever comes along with the JavaScript APIs inside your runtime. So if you're in Node, that's going to be the V8-based WebAssembly engine. Um, If you're in another non-Chromium browser, it's going to be a different thing. Um, But the web always comes with a really great, super performant WebAssembly engine. So In JavaScript, Xtism is adding this layer of convenience to, again, make it super portable. So if you compiled some code for an Xtism host that works in a Go application, you want to run it in that JavaScript application, the JavaScript SDK from Xtism will make that code immediately work with no no change. Um, And then there's a number of additional things that you're going to need to do if you just use the JavaScript built-in APIs um, to call WebAssembly code. And the most notable of those is for something very simple, which is just allocating and passing a string across the boundary. And so in order to do this, there are a couple of steps uh, that you as the developer on both the embedding side in JavaScript and then the calling side, the WebAssembly code, um, have to coordinate on, which is, well, how do we allocate memory from the host into WASM? How do I address that memory? And how do I write and read into that memory? And so there has to be a coordination between the JavaScript side and the WebAssembly side in order to do that. And there are some in-progress standards. You already had um, somebody on recently to talk about kind of the string built-in imports uh, that the web browsers are 
yeah, helping to had, make this ran from feature Mozilla much podcast, easier. Yeah. Hmm? Which is super exciting, and I can't wait for that to land. That'll simplify a lot of things. Um, but then there's also a level of like permission and security and uh, access management that Bexism has done a lot of work to make simple. So if you want to provide access to a remote network um, that the WebAssembly code can call from within your JavaScript environment. In the web in particular, this is very, very difficult because of the blocking problem inside of the browser. It's never okay to block the main thread inside of a JavaScript app. And if you do a normal fetch call, there's a tremendous amount of work in order to make that a non-blocking thing in the browser, which you know requires spinning up worker threads um, and handling kind of atomic management of operations across the, th- the worker thread into the main thread to pass data in and out and synchronize it across that boundary. So if you start to do very sophisticated things in WebAssembly in JavaScript, you probably are going to find yourself in a situation where you're going to want a framework to help. And Xism just makes some of that stuff a lot easier where you don't have to think about it. It's just kind of there for you to use. Makes sense. So it's like a convenience layer that is uh, yeah, putting you in a pit of success as we like to talk about <laughs> these kind of things at Google. Nice. That's right. Um, so let's talk about some of the actual integrations of, or integrators rather, of uh, Xtism. So there's a blog post that you wrote uh, called uh, Beyond the HTTP API WebAssembly and the Future of Systems Integration. And in this blog post, you mentioned Stripe and Figma. But can you just um, yeah, give us some examples of pro- projects, products uh, that have integrated with with, uh, like Basm, with Xtism. Yeah, sure. Um, we have, first of all, point people to the Xtism repository on GitHub, github.com slash Xtism slash Xtism. There's a discussion that has a huge list of projects that people like to put up on their own, or we find projects and list them uh, if they're open source and you know we, we can talk about them publicly. Um, but some of the most notable ones, um, there's this uh, huge insurance company in France called MAFE, um, and they have uh, a bunch of software that they run internally, as you'd imagine. And a lot of that is behind, you know, service proxies, uh, routing traffic, filtering traffic, handling, you know, traffic manipulation rules and things like that. That proxy is something they built in-house called Otoroshi. And Otoroshi has a flexible plugin system that is implemented uh, using Xdism. So um, similar to how kind of Envoy Proxy has a WebAssembly runtime to do HTTP traffic filtering and things like that. This Otoroshi project is actually written in Java um, and Xtism. Uh, at one point, was really the only way to run WebAssembly inside of a Java application. And so they found Xtism and uh, we worked closely with them to kind of help figure out how to make plugins work inside of this, this proxy, which is pretty cool. Um, another one is uh, a friend of our, our company's um, called Moon Repo. Um, and Moon Repo has a, a really cool set of developer tools for managing build environments. And so they wanted to have a configurable way to configure a build environment and install things like Bun or uh, the Go compiler or whatever. And so all of these kind of installation and configuration steps are implemented as Xtism plugins, uh, which is really cool because a common problem with build tools and developer tools is like Windows support. And so everybody likes to build on Mac or Linux. And then when it comes to the Windows developer, you know, a lot of command line tools are often unsupported there. Because the code executes in WebAssembly, um, it's very portable and therefore executes just the same on Windows as it does Linux and Mac. So the benefit there is that all of Moon repos developers, independent of the system they're working on, get to benefit from all the same plugins that work you know, uh, on other operating systems. Um, one password, uh, the large password management company, uh, distributes their SDK, um, wrapping a lot of core logic inside of Xtism plugins. So if you're calling their Go SDK or their Python SDK, you actually are calling Rust code that's compiled to WASM, loaded as an Xtism plugin inside of those SDKs. Those are all open source in their one password uh, organization. You can check those out. Um, There's even a really cool Rust-based Minecraft server. They implemented Minecraft in Rust and have a plugin system for modding that uh, using Xtism. Um, Yeah, the list goes on. Uh, I would would point people to uh, that discussion and go check out all these projects because there's some really, really amazing stuff that people are building, things that we never even envisioned possible. I'll mention one other one, which is this... LED matrix board that's fully programmable using 
Xism plugins. So someone's got Xism running on their hardware uh, directly powering this awesome light, light board. Cool, nice. We will link to all of those uh, in the show notes. Um, so I think the first time that I was aware of, uh, or I was made aware of um, Xism is a project called Enhance.dev. And um, what they do is um, they have this idea of, hey, let's just have um, components that you write um, and then like like write in whatever language you, you want. And then um, you run Xtism and you get um, the components compiled and uh, yeah able to execute directly in various runtimes. Um, have you heard of that? Definitely. Yeah, Brian came on our uh, uh, like Xtism community stream. Um, maybe we can link to that as well. And they've mm -hmm. got some amazing stuff in the works. Uh, Enhance is a really, really cool framework. And I think it really shows the power of WebAssembly in a way that maybe no one expected, which it, to begin with, people thought it was going to be a JavaScript killer. They thought, oh no, running other code in the browser is going to you know, obviate the need for JavaScript because now we have every other language that you can write and build web applications with. But actually the inverse is, is true that web, WebAssembly is actually making JavaScript more useful because now you can bring parts of the web into other applications where JavaScript is no longer bound to the browser. And of course we've had server runtimes forever, um, but you haven't really been able to run JavaScript very easily inside your Ruby application. And that's not, not true any longer. So Enhance has taken um, web components, the standard from our browsers, and brought them to a server-side rendering environment, enabling you to write standard web components, including HTML, JavaScript, and CSS, and bundle them into a WASM module and run them from any application independent of the language it's written in. So as long as there's an X, Xism SDK for Java, Python, PHP, Ruby, Rust, Go, anything you can think of, you can now run and execute web components inside of those environments and render your web application um, from those those servers too. Pretty cool project for sure, yeah. Um, you did a better job at explaining uh, than I did, um, but yeah, definitely <laughs> something to, to check out. Um, before we wrap up, I want to just briefly uh, talk a little bit about Chicory as well. Um, so can you give us a rundown uh, on, on Chicory, what, what it is, what it does, um, maybe just some motivations, why you built it? Absolutely. So um, yeah, whether you're building an Android application or a Java server or some desktop software, uh, there's lots and lots of Java code out there in the world, and most of it couldn't run WebAssembly. Um, and I'll be clear, like this is not about taking Java code and compiling it to WebAssembly. It's actually the inverse. This is taking WebAssembly code and running it inside of your Java application. And um, I will point, there was, there was one project um, by Oracle, the Growl VM has a language it supports. It supports WebAssembly executing inside of Growl. Um, and you can use the Growl WASM project. Um, but we had figured there's you know room for another runtime um, that is a little more independent um, and wanted to build something that was very flexible and supported every JDK. And so um, from the very beginning, Chicory has decided to target uh, as old as JDK 11. So lots and lots and lots of Java applications can now run WebAssembly. Um, and the only alternative um, to Graal at the time was to link a... Um, a, a shared library like Wasm Time or Wasmer um, <clears throat> into your Java code. And for lots and lots of reasons, you know, Java developers who run the JVM just don't like to do this. Um, it's the same problem that Go developers run into using CGO, meaning that in order to distribute that Java application, which used to be just a jar, uh, which is very easy to move around and execute, orchestrate, and run, you now have to also bring the shared library. And the shared library is platform specific. So if I'm running my Java, the, the JVM is running on a ARM64 chip, uh, I have to have the ARM version of the shared library. Um, it compounds with the operating system that it's running on. There's a different format for Mac and there is Linux and there is Windows. So the distribution of those Java apps be basically becomes deteriorated by having to additionally ship the shared library for every single platform the JVM is going to run on. And um, that is like usually an unfortunate showstopper for most Java applications to then use WebAssembly. And so we just thought there deserves to be a proper Java runtime that can be loaded as a Java library and require no additional dependencies for distributing that application. It's just Java. 
And um, the Chicory project started as an interpreter. Um, and just recently, maybe a few months ago, um, our ahead of time compiler um, reached parity in test support passing uh, with the interpreter. So now it's fully spec compliant. And the Chicory project takes WebAssembly code and on the fly converts it into JVM bytecode. And so we take that WASM bytecode and convert each instruction to JVM bytecode. So that the JVM can do all the same optimizations on that code as it would Java code to begin with. So the performance of Chicory uh, is on par with every other you know, major WebAssembly runtime that compiles to native code, um, but it runs pure on the JVM. So talking of native, I remember when I was a student um, way, way back in the early 2000s, um, Java was pretty hot. And um, something that they taught us is Java is relatively slow, but there's a way to make it fast by calling it into native. I think Jay and I and Genie, something like that, Java native interface, maybe. Um, so are you reinventing Java native interface, but for WebAssembly? Or is this like entirely a wrong interpretation of what you just said? It's well, so we're not reinventing the Java native interface. The J JNI is really more like FFI, like we talked about in the beginning of the episode, being able to take Java code and call into that C library for some high performance routine. And in order to um, keep all the code in Java, Chicory can actually kind of remove some of the need for the JNI because you can compile that C code to WASM and then now run the WASM code directly inside of the Java application, never having to kind of break the purity of the JVM. The JVM comes with all these really special characteristics. I can observe everything. I can tune everything. I've got control over the runtime and its memory usage and how the compiler works and the optimizations that are done. And as soon as you call out of Java into some native code, you break that promise that the JVM gives you. And so really people want to keep everything inside the JVM as much as possible. And so now instead of using JNI to go talk to SQLite, for example, compile SQLite to WASM and run it directly inside of Java, and you get to keep all the same benefits that every bit of Java code gets when it runs inside the JVM. Um, and Java isn't slow anymore um, like it was. Java is actually extremely fast because of all the work that teams have done on, for, for example, the hotspot compiler inside of the VM, um, which converts Java bytecode, which was interpreted into native instructions for the platform the JVM runs on. So Java is very fast, um, and now we can make WASM just as fast as Java because the WASM code effectively becomes Java code. Very exciting. Yeah, so as I said, this was uh, early 2000s, if I'm not mistaken. So Java definitely has come a long way. Um, nice. Sure um, this brings us to the uh, final part of the show, which is uh, WASM, but not. And we talked about WebAssembly.instantiate streaming before. Um, so when you, Steve, uh, instantiate streaming on one of your streaming devices these days, what is it that you uh, watch or hear or listen to? Uh, the, the mo most recently, I kind of stumbled into this show called Alone. Um, I found it on Netflix and it's like a survivalist show. Uh, I'm not like a survivalist. I do love the outdoors, uh, but these people build, they go into the woods and the goal is to figure out like, how do I build some shelter? How do I find sources of food and water and all these things? And they go out and they live for like a hundred days on their own by themselves. Uh, and it's pretty amazing to see what they build. Uh, but I think that the thing that I like the most about it is it lets you compress time. They spend a hundred days, but you watch in an hour uh, of like how people change and what kind of, you know, um, philosophical, you know, changes they go through, what kind of physical changes they go through. Uh, so it's just interesting to see, you know, the, the impact on, on people when they go into a completely different environment than they're used to and being able to compress that time and see what happens over a hundred day period in, you know, just an hour or so. So are they actually alone or is they are they so, um, surrounded by cameramen, camera women? <laughs> no, they have to rig their own cameras and equipment and carry it around and uh, film themselves and all this. So it's pretty wild. It's just a, it's a pretty crazy show. Very interesting. I will give this uh, a watch. Um, cool. The next one is uh, local get global set. So if there's anything that you could local get from you and global set it onto the world, what would it be? Or if you want, you can also reverse the question if there's something um, that you would uh, globally get from the world and then local set onto you. I think this maybe goes back on our uh, our component model conversation. I, I wish that people would spend a little less time worrying about the standards and thinking about the standards first 
and think about value first and do more testing and have more people use the things that are being proposed before they're implemented, before they're widely adopted, before they're standardized. Make sure we're doing the right thing. Make sure we're building value today. Make sure we're considering all these use cases um, and worry about standards later. The standards should come from what's being used and popularized, not what a small group of people thinks should be done from the outset. So you jQuery approach, make the thing happen and work, and then you standardize document query selector all and stuff. Exactly. Just like we do in the web. <laughs> all right. Um, are you on any of the social networks if people want to uh, follow up with you? Maybe challenge your uh, perception of the Bytecode Alliance or something. You can get into flame Please wars do. online. <laughs> Yeah, keep me from starting them and let me <laughs> contribute to them. Uh, I'm on X, and it's the best way to reach me, x.com slash nilslice, N-I-L-S-L-I-C-E. It's also my GitHub username. Uh, if you want to follow along what we're working on, that's also a good place to start. Uh, but yeah, thanks thanks so much for having me, and um, I'm happy to chat, chat more online. Amazing, yeah. But like, please don't start any flame wars. Be, be nice to each other. <laughs> be good. Um, we can always solve... Uh, differences in opinions um, with nice, friendly arguments. There's no need for filling voice. It's all in good fun for the benefit of the future of WebAssembly. <laughs> exactly. All right. Cool. Thank you so much, Steve, for being on the show today. Um, if you have something to say about WebAssembly, as always, reach out. Um, Steve was one of those persons who reached out proactively and then said, hey, um, we're building this thing. Um, can I be on the show? And absolutely, please uh, be my guest. And uh, yeah, with that, thanks for listening. Thanks for watching. And um, I see you all next time. Goodbye. Thank you, Steve, again. Thank you. Take care.